Hello, Rim the Most High God, and welcome to another edition of the Kingdom Intelligence Briefing. Cabby's purpose is to be an intelligence briefing for the body of Messiah that will both inform and empower the remnant in the last days. We want you to know that you're not alone. There are more of us than you realize. And the ranks of resistance against Mystery Babylon is growing all over the world. This is episode number 436. I'm your host, Dr. Michael Lake, and I'm in the KIB studio today with the love of my life, Mary Lou. Hello, everyone. What a wonderful day this is. We're in here early this week. We're on a, in here on a Sunday morning because we have so much going on this next week, and this will be the last podcast we have for three weeks because we're going into the um, conference. The conference. Yeah. And so we wanted to be sure and talk to you guys before we got into this busy week, so uh, we're in here on a Sunday morning. It's a beautiful sunny day, and we're thankful to be alive, aren't we, sweetheart? Yes, we are, and excited about Passover. Yes, uh, which is uh, starts Monday night uh, through Tuesday night. That's we're still following that traditional calendar. I felt like this year would be a good year to stand with Israel. Um, I know there's all kinds of of different opinions about what's going on in Israel right now, but that's that's that land that's that God has dedicated his people. It's significant in his word. It's significant to to him. He tells us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, and that is what we're doing. And uh, so we're going to take that specific time and and be praying this week and thanking Jesus for the sacrifice that he made for all of us. What a... Absolutely. He was... What a a love. He was the Lamb of God that Abraham promised when he was willing to offer up Isaac on the altar. What a love he had. And ever since from Abraham all the way to John the Baptist declared, there's the Lamb of God. Yes, that's right. And so we're excited. We have so many good things going on this week. Uh, I do have a, a prayer request I wanted to bring before you. We've been praying about this for several days. We heard from one of our prayer partners that uh, her husband was very ill. He has an extremely enlarged gallbladder, something blocking his bile duct, jaundice, and pancreatitis. Um, <clears throat> he has clotting issues, and so he takes Coumadin. And the doctors were thinking his blood is too thin for surgery. But they need to remove the gallbladder for his liver to heal. And since then, I got another. We started praying then. We got another uh, email saying that the doctors had decided to go ahead and do the surgery. Uh, and I haven't heard back since then. But I just asked you to join with us and just ask for a healing anointing yes. to, to flow. And that, that Complete rest we've already been flow. praying, you know, for, about the doctors and, and everyone that's involved in, the, in this surgery. But there's still going to be a process of... Uh, of healing, and I mean these are these are serious issues here, and so um, we just ask that you join with us. and And the daughter of this uh, this man had reminded his her mom to call us and pray because I I think that they they know the prayer partners how wonderful they are to pray with us. And so if you would all agree with us in prayer for God to restore, and um, we always just pray that no matter what somebody's going through, that they're going to be in, end up in better health at the end of this, total restoration than they were when they went through it. That's right. And the second thing um, that we wanted to talk about, which I didn't even know till this morning where God, God had us going with this, um, I just kept... Looking at all of these different um, podcasts and and things that are about where foreign foreigners are buying up the U.S. agricultural land, and we happen to I happen to see uh, a prime time of Dr. Phil that was on YouTube that they all connect. You know, if one thing comes up about this, you'll see other things, and so I watched it, and and you watched it later. And what a revelatory thing that was. It, it's alarming. You know, when you look at it, it looks like uh, China owns about half of California, which would explain Newsom in California. Uh, um, but also the, how strategically they have purchased land near most of our strategic military bases. And that's alarming to me. That's, uh, in, in fact, one of the articles that I was reading here, they, they stopped one in North Dakota because they were going to build a grain mill right next to an Air Force base, and they said, no, no, that's a security risk. It's like, finally, the governments woke up. But, I mean, some of our more strategic places, where like with like here in Missouri where, where the stealth bomber is, they got stuff right out in it. They have stuff in the proving ground, so if we're ever testing new weapons, they can keep an eye on all of it. Well, and it's, it's alarming. Uh, I'm, I'm convinced that as long as they've had these this farming area, China's probably built something underground. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's that's just would be logical of what they would do. Um, Mike's going to put the link to that 
um, video with Dr. Phil, and he has a um, a farmer on there, a black man that actually has uh, his family for several generations has owned the property, and he's talking about the devastating effect of the nearby land being owned by China because they, uh, for one thing, like where it was going for $3,000 an acre, then they were paying $20,000 an acre. So then that turned around and made uh, their their taxes go through the roof. And then they also bought where he sells his grain to. And so, I mean, there's yeah. it, it's, it's alarming when you see this and you, it shows you the, the map of the United States and all these red areas on the map are where they've bought uh, farmland. And we've got several in Missouri. There are some states that don't have any, but there are several in Missouri. One looks like it's um, somewhere between Springfield and Branson. There's an area. And then down in the uh, southwest corner, that, that corner area is on. And so. Then Andrews Air Force Base, they've mm-hmm. got a, a big plot of land up there. And, you know, when, when you look at strategic warfare, there, there are several things that you have to do. If you're going to overcome the enemy, you have to control their supply lines, which is what? Food. Okay, you've got to control the food, and you have to control communications, and you have to keep an eye on their military. And, Mary, it seems to me like, you know, most of our computer parts now are all made in China, and there's, there's, then they, they have actually caught them uh, several times putting what they were fearful were spy devices like in certain equipment, so now... Uh, one of the main companies out of China, uh, both Great Britain and America, says we cannot have any other equipment uh, in our in our infrastructure, and in, especially if it's going to be in sensitive communication. Uh, and there's no telling what else is there that they haven't caught. This but- is this is such a scheme. This has been going on probably before the Clintons, but we know that the Clintons had had an impact in this. Well, it goes all the way back to Nixon. Um, and so, but but. Um, the thing that was encouraging to me is a lot of people watch Dr. Phil that wouldn't ever look at a conspiracy theory side or, or listen to anything else. And I, I was so excited when I saw that he did this because this is something that a lot of people will see. And I think your average American would be very alarmed by this. Yes. And, and this will cause prompt them to raise up, call senators, uh, take action, hopefully pray. That's what we're... And it, it, it shows us a, a problem with where we have taken capitalism in that everything's for sale. Our land is for sale. Our businesses are for sale. Our politicians are for sale. I mean, we, we have, we have not kept an eye on the multinational corporations that I really think are going to be part of the market, the B system, because they don't care about America. They actually, they're looking at enslaving the world. Well, that, that's it. It's all a, a one part of a big a big plan. Yeah. And um, like a, like we said, Mike is going to put the link to that video. In, our, in, in, in the show description. And so I, I would recommend everybody watch that so that you have that down. And, and if you see on here and you are a state that has this land, you can do like we are. Because I had no idea that there's a huge amount of land up in northern Missouri. Looks like it's like Hannibal all in that area. Um, that is has been owned now um, the the truth is that china has been very strategic in what they've been buying it's been around military bases i was i was really surprised i pulled up a uh, article on uh, forbes magazine and it's entitled how much u.s land does china really own uh more than bill gates other and uh, more than bill gates and less than other 17 other countries and they list that there are 109 countries that own u.s agricultural land China ranks 18th far below Canada. Now, listen to this. Canada, our neighbors up north, own 12.8 million acres. That that blows my mind, Mary. The Netherlands. Yeah, I I was thinking that Bill Gates owned more than anybody, the way that I'd heard it talked about. But he's, did you just mention how much he owned, like around 270,000 acres? Yes, he owns 248,000 acres. Uh, the Netherlands owns 4.8 million. Italy owns 2.7 million. The United Kingdom, 2.5 million. Germany, 2.2 million. Portugal, 1.4 million. France, 1.3 million. Denmark, 856,000. Luxembourg, 802,000 uh, acres. And Ireland, 760,000. Now, what's interesting is everybody's up in arms about Bill Gates. 
Uh, but Bill Gates is number 41. Number 24 on the list is Jeff Bezos from Amazon, who owns 420,000 acres. He owns twice as much as Bill Gates does. Oh, it's still not good any way you look at it. It's, it's, it's just, not good in any way that you look at it. And then you look at those uh, UN biospheres. Yeah. You know, we looked that up. And uh, where they have the biospheres and the World Heritage Parks. I mean, this this isn't good. This is... I remember years ago, I, I had stuff. gone up to... Uh, up into Minnesota, and I was doing a, a conference up there, and we, I had several people that were farmers, and they were they were they were complaining because the UN basically took their farmland and saying this is now a biosphere, you can't plant farmland, even though that farmland had been in their family for many generations. They just simply took the land and say for for the sake of global warming and all this, we're we're, we're just now going to let let it lay fallow, and and just took the land from them as well as. Uh, we have given them some of our national parks. I remember reading articles, and this was back when Bill Clinton was was president, that there were national parks people go to visit, and all of a sudden there's these U.N. signs saying no trespassing. It was paid for by federal U.S. Mm-hmm. taxpayer dollars, and now we don't even have access yeah, to this, it. Yeah, this is part of what happens when the body of Christ falls asleep. Yes. We just get lulled into some kind of complacency. We've all been there. We sure were there years ago where our whole Life. I mean, we we prayed with what I knew to pray. I, I would say prayers. I felt like I was very ineffective. But back when I was in such bondage, our life revolved around: okay, you do what you got to do during the day. Uh, you work. You, uh, and you fix meals, and you come home and you watch TV. Yeah. And you you just you know go clip through the news long enough to get the weather, and then you get to some. Uh, insane sitcom and sit there and fill your mind with a bunch of junk. <laughs> I mean, we've all been there. And and it's, I know for me, you know, this deliverance that God did on me and the healing restoration in my life, I I can't even, um, I can't even picture how we used to live. I, I look at that and I just think, man, you talk about a slumber, spiritual slumber. Well, I think, I think it's a combination of spiritual slumber and when, when you know we're we're very big on on understanding and keeping the commandments, God said, "Listen, when you come in covenant with with me, and you break that covenant, covenant, foreigners will own your land. You'll end up working for for foreigners. All these different things. That's exactly what's happening right now in America. Uh, with most of our food processing in the in the last probably ten fifteen years is either owned by other countries, or they." The ones that weren't burned down, you know, it's like, it's 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 frightening what what has been going on, and the media is is paid to be asleep. Our politicians act like they don't care, and I've even wondered, you know, how many times that we've seen, okay, this this plant all, all of a sudden mysteriously had E. coli or whatever, and so many millions of pounds of ground beef or whatever had to be destroyed or something. I wonder if that isn't actually not being destroyed, but going into underground bases. And, there, and I don't think thing. that we have any way of determining the truth no. on that, but we sure better be praying about it. Um, and, you know, I've been trying to, to stick closer to spiritual issues and talk about elections and things like that. I do think there's been an overemphasis on the need for President Trump in there over the spiritual aspect of things. I do think God can use him. I think in this situation where it's unless there's some upsets and and they pull people out and put others in, it looks like it's going to be uh, Biden against Trump again. And so um and you know, I'll, I'll go as far as say this. If we let's say we do get Trump in, unless we have revival in America, it isn't going to matter. It's, it it is going to be Releasing the power of God and the fire of God on the streets, Mm -hmm. in homes, in churches, that's going to begin affecting things. This is this is you you cannot overcome a spiritual problem with a political solution. No, but but they can work in tandem. In the practical sense, though, I mean, we see what Biden has done. We see what the agenda was. We see all of that, and I wanted to just. this was in an article on Share America several years ago. 
It said that Secretary of State Mike Pompeo told the German Marshall Fund in 2018 that while nations may join international organizations that address common objectives, nothing can replace the nation-state as the guarantor of de democratic freedoms and national interests. Sovereignty issues arise if those organizations usurp the powers of self-governing nations. The International Criminal Court, for example, has attempted to assert jurisdiction over citizens of states that never agreed to the court statute. This is one reason why President Trump told the U.S. In. We will never surrender America's sovereignty to an unelected, unaccountable global bureaucracy. Which and, is the model that we have with the European Common Market. And I, I mean, if he would stand by that, that would be very Union. helpful during yeah. this time because if we don't get on top of this where they've got this, this foreign soil and they've already brought, uh, you know, Chinese across the border that could be going to these places that are owned and no telling what's being planned, we're in for a terrible trouble. And, you know, we've already said... Um, they, they could end up being a Trojan horse, exactly, because um, they, they, could, they could already be fully armed, fully right. equipped for whatever they need to and, do. And that's, that's a very good analogy, that it, that it would be a Trojan horse sit right in our midst. Because um, you if, you, if you're bringing in all this, all this building equipment or mm -hmm. all this farm equipment, you can kind of mix a few tanks in here or there, and it's all this equipment, and nobody's paying attention because it's covered up in tarps. But Mary, over five, six, seven years, you you could have oh battalions fully equipped. There's no telling what's. I I know for certain there are things underground nobody knows about. So, um, you know, recently, not too long ago, our, the Arkansas governor, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, mm -hmm. um, she went through a thing, and they they're going through a process where Arkansas uh, has been ordered ordered the Chinese company's subsidiary to div divest itself of agricultural land and they're they're going to make it to where you the chinese can't buy land in arkansas i think all the states should follow suit yeah i that's that's one step that we need to be praying about um because this it's already here and you know the i think the united and although i've prayed about this and i think there have been national prayer meetings about it and asking forgiveness for where the when the people were here took the land away from the native americans mm-hmm you know, I, that was a sin in my book. It was. I mean, it put we them on the reservations. Landmarks. Right. We we did what the Bible says not to do. And I've sure asked forgiveness for those sins of because I, I think I've come from the ones that were the Native American and the ones that did it. Uh, I'm quite a mixture. <laughs> but um, I've prayed over that. But but there's see, there's a sowing and reaping process. And, and even, I don't even understand, I'm not a history buff, other people would probably know this better than me, but I don't know what all went on down in Texas when we took land from Mexico. You know what I'm saying? When, when a nation sows things, there's a reaping process. And so we've got to ask God to forgive the sins uh, so that that judgment won't come back upon us and, and the land be taken from us. What's what's the, the the name of the big group? It's about men being men. It was pro, oh, promise, promise keepers. keepers yeah. Uh, I remember, and this is one of the things I'm hoping helps with this. Uh, it probably been 15 years ago or so. They had gathered, and at the, at the meeting they had a big meeting up in up in the D.C. area. They had literally believers from every Indian tribe in America get up and forgive. I remember that, and I I think those are things that help in this process. Yeah. But there's still you know there there's been so much bloodshed, innocent bloodshed, so many things that have. You know, the way I think most people look at judgment is just just uh, God just gets to a point and then, then he says, okay, that's it. And I do think that's part of the process of what goes on. But see, this judgment, the way I, I saw it all those years ago when God showed me judgment was coming, it's already headed toward us. Yeah. I mean, it is, it is on a fast-moving and, and vehicle I, coming And I think it comes in layers. I think some of it, you reap what you sow. And it's the same as if I if I'd go out here and I'd plant cucumbers, cucumbers grow up. That is a that is a a natural level of of judgment. God saying you do these these things will come back. Now there gets to be a certain time that it gets to be so pronounced that God says, okay, if He first removes His hand, and then He makes a fist and He comes down with judgment. And and each part of it, I think, in each stage, if we repent. And you know the body when you when you read the Bible, it doesn't say that we need to get Washington D.C. to repent. We doesn't say that we those that are called by my name. If we'll if we'll hit our knees, that makes a big difference. 
And I think it can cause the fear of God to even come on. Uh, I think politicians have lost the fear of God. The church has lost oh, the fear for of sure. God. Yeah. Uh, but a return of the fear of the Lord and repentance can turn the tide of almost anything. It's true. And and that's what, what I feel like that our, our ministry is a part of, is getting people to to where they're they're able to stand and pray in these situations and not be destroyed. Because we've all seen this. We've all seen people get involved in spiritual warfare. Satan comes in some door that they may not even know they have, and the next thing you know, they're not here anymore. And so um, God has been so good to us in that area uh, through the years to show us one thing after another um, so that we could get doors closed, we could repent, we could get to a position to where we can stand strong because what what the one of the main things we're fighting in this nation is Jezebel and Ahab. Yes. Um, you know, Jezebel in the Old Testament was she was a Baal worshiper that married Ahab, the king of Israel. She was a Baal worshiper, uh, and the, the, so the, they would have sacrificed babies. That's what they yeah. did. They sacrificed babies, and because well, she served the god of, of prosperity, pleasure, and, and all these different uh, things. But it was because of their Baal worship, it brought, for temporarily, it brought great prosperity to the land. That's why, that's why, and you know, later on, we, we talked about, I think in the last podcast, that the, the king of Judah went and married their daughter. It's like, okay, I, I can either follow my father Jehoshaphat and that got Israel, but their way looks like it produces more results. And Mary, how much... Have we followed in America and, and in the church the ways of Baal, whether we recognize it or not, because it produced more money and more results in, in, in our carnal eyes. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you can, have, you can have the biggest ministry in the world, but if it's not transforming lives, bringing people to a true encounter with Jesus, and it's producing holiness and repentance and all the things that we see in the Word of God, it's in vain. Unless the Lord builds the house, those that labor, labor in vain. Mm-hmm. And eventually, if, if, if it is if it, it's Balin Associates, God's forced to judge it for his great namesake. Right. And uh, that's, that's what I came to this morning. Because, uh, you know, there have been a lot of people asking about Jezebel and Ahab because the last uh, podcast we did. And we've talked about it on a lot of podcasts um, I hope you guys aren't sick of hearing about this, but it's so uh, relevant to what we're going through right now in the the United States. And so, okay, we've got all this stuff where they're coming in and taking the land. So I want to go to 1 Kings 21. Uh, Oh, I wrote this off in the... I printed it off, and it printed it in the New International Version. Usually we don't use that, so that's a mistake on my part. I got the New King James right here. Okay, let me have it then. I didn't even notice that. I thought it was... Okay. Okay, we're going to read down through here. Let me get get to where I stopped at 15. Okay, I'm going to start reading in verse 21 of 1 Kings. And it came to pass after these things that Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard which was in Jezreel next to the palace of Ahab king of Samaria. So Ahab spoke to Naboth saying, give me your vineyard that I may have it for a vegetable garden. <laughs> I don't think I'd ever noticed that part before in, in connection with what yeah. we're talking about. Let, but me, let me rip what, what your yeah. ancestors have, have cultivated for generations. And we're going to grow these vegetables. They may be weird vegetables that have been genetically modified, uh, but we're going to grow vegetables. I just got a hankering for zucchini, <laughs> and I'm going to tear up your garden. So anyway, it says, uh, give me your vineyard that I may have it for a vegetable garden, because it is near next to my house, and for it I will give you a vineyard better than it. Or if it seems good to you, I will give you its worth in money. But Naboth said to Ahab, The Lord forbid that I should give the inheritance of my fathers to you. That's significant. So Ahab went into his house sullen and displeased because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him. For he had said, I will not give you the inheritance of my fathers. And he lay down in his bed and turned away his face and would eat no food and was pouting like a little boy. (laughs) 
And that's kind of how that Ahab spirit works. I'm king, but he said no. And here comes the big hero. But Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said to him, Why is your spirit so sullen that you eat no food? He said to her, Because I spoke to Naboth the Jezreelite and said to him, Give me your vineyard for money, or else if it pleases you, I will give you another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give you my vineyard. Then Jezebel, his wife, said to him, You now exercise authority over Israel. Arise, eat food, and let your heart be cheerful. I will give you the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. And she wrote letters in Ahab's name, sealed them with his seal, and sent the letters to the elders and the nobles who were dwelling in the city with Naboth. She wrote in the letters saying, Proclaim a fast and seat Naboth with high honor among the people, and seat two men, scoundrels, before him to bear witness against him, saying, You have blasphemed God and the king. Then take him out and stone him that he may die. Have you ever seen such manipulation? So let's go on. So the men of his city, the elders and nobles who were inhabitants of his city, did as Jezebel had sent to him as it was written in the letters which had been sent to them. They proclaimed a fast and seated Naboth with high honor among the people. Two men, scoundrels, came in and sat before him. The scoundrels witnessed against him, bore false witness, didn't they? Uh, in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth has blasphemed God and the king. Then they took him outside the city and stoned him with stones, so that he died. Then they sent to Jezebel, saying, Naboth has been stoned and is dead. And it came to pass when Jezebel heard that Naboth had been stoned and was dead, that Jezebel said to Ahab, Arise, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite, which he refused to give you for money, for Naboth is not alive but dead. So it was when Ahab heard that Naboth was dead that Ahab got up and went down to take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. So here's a pattern. Yes. They, take, they take the land. Yes. We've got a principality or two that at least, I mean, these are just some of the principalities that are reigning in the United States, but Jezebel is key it is. That's why every household, unless they come from godly generations and you know have not had trouble in their family, I know that there's godly people that would never have trouble with this, but most American has, households are being affected by Jezebel and Ahab. Yes, they are. And it's because we're under that jurisdiction. Especially since uh, the Libin, women's lib movement, I think it's put it into steroids. I think it was already there. But it really put it in steroids with the women's lib movement. It, it did, because it puts things out of order. Mm-hmm. Um, and so here we are in a, in a similar setting where the land's being taken. It is. And Jezebel will be behind this, taking the land. And, you know, there, there's a reason they want to destroy the United States. There's, there's original covenants that, that matter. Israel and the United States, as far as I know, correct me if I'm wrong, Mike, are they the only two nations anywhere that are covenantal yes. with God? Yes. I didn't think there was one that, that was That was at their foundation. Some of them claimed to have been covenantal. That they, they, they were converted to Christianity. Mm-hmm. But, there, but at the very foundation of it, it was, it was America and Israel. Not only is she after the land, but she's after the inheritance and the legacy. Yes, and that, that, that is so important. We need to understand biblically. You know, when, when Israel went into the promised land, certain families were, certain tribes were given certain areas. That was to be perpetual. God even had to say, listen, if you go into debt and you end up losing the land after, when you get to a year jubilee, it has to go back to the mm-hmm. family. Because this it was important. It, it, it was important. That's where we actually we, we draw in America that land ownership is a part of freedom. It's, it's a part of establishing our, our, our freedom that we have as Americans mm-hmm. as land ownership, which uh, in Europe and stuff, it, it was, you know, we, they had land lords. Nobody owned everybody. Rented. That's what they're trying to take us back to, to turn us all right. back into serfs. Because the land, especially when you, you look at this, he says, I'm going to give you a better vineyard. Well, king, that vineyard was not cultivated by the blood, sweat, and tears of my great, 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 great grandfather, and and so forth, from generation to generation, it may have been one of the finest vineyards in in all of Israel at the time. Uh, I mean, because when whenever we look at uh, look at wine, look at vineyards, it's it's all about not only cultivation, but the, the lineage of the vines is is, is uh, some of the, some of those may are priceless, and it it has to do with the soil and all these different things, and so he was he was after. His legacy. Right now, the Antichrist spirit 
and Jezebel and Ahab are, are working with the Antichrist spirit is to steal the legacy yeah. that, that was originally in America because they, they've got to take away the freedom to bring about the new world order. Mm-hmm. That's it. And it's, it's all involved in that. But the, but the Bible says we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. No. It's these principalities. But again, we've got a, a precedent in the <clears throat> Word of how God feels about that. Because right after that, Elijah came down and essentially said, you're a dead man yeah. because of what you did. And Ahab and Jezebel both had horrible deaths. They so did. I, a, I think there was, there was, in a sense, poetic justice. You know, Elisha came down and said, listen, the very place where the dogs lick the blood of the man that you had killed, that's where they're going to lick your blood. And as for your wife, the dogs aren't going to lick the blood. They're going to eat her flesh. Well, and remember when Jehu went and the eunuchs threw Jezebel out the, out the window and the emasculating spirit that emasculates men makes them them spiritual eunuchs, they th- they turned around through her out the window. And so we've got precedent here that we can take all of this information and we can present it before our Father in heaven and say, Father, we're asking that you judge these spirits. Father, if you judge these spirits, the American households can can come awake. Mm-hmm. Father, they, they've got a, a stronghold in the American households. And Father, we need to ask you for justice. Father, I stand upon what you told me a couple of years ago at our first conference, that if, if we ripped the contracts, the contracts, that you would rip this injustice. And Father, I just present before you what Jezebel has done in the homes of the, of the Americans. Yes. How, how this, this spirit has manipulated and uh, went behind the scenes and, and, uh, we just, we just present it before you and ask forgiveness for every sin that has put this in place. And, Father, I just ask that you would turn it around to give us, give us a chance to become that nation that you can use. Father, I don't stand here in a prideful way over the pride of this nation because, Father, we are so fallen in your eyes. We have, we have done these abominations in your sight, and so we ask you to forgive that. But I cry out against these demonic powers, Father, for what they've done. Father, you can see it. It's strategic. It's, it's manipulative in everything to, to come in and just destroy everything that, you, that you've done. And, Father, you've used people in this nation. You have been able to spread the gospel from this nation. And so for your great name's sake, you know, because earlier in this, Mike, earlier in this story is when Ahab had won a victory. And, and it kept saying this, and I thought, well, this is significant because the ones coming against uh, Israel were the ones that were saying, uh, well, God's, God protects them in the hills, but we've got to take them in the valleys. It's like they were saying, okay, God's only here, but he's not going to be in the valleys. So, but let me tell you something. God showed them. He wasn't just the God of the hills. He's the God of the valleys. Yes, he's he the is. God over all. And I declare he's the God over this nation. And what we have to do is rise up in an Elijah anointing and say, we're not going to take this anymore. We're not going to, ta- we're not going to let it be in our homes. We're not going to let it be uh, in, the, in this nation. We're going to stand against it. You know, we're, we don't have to do any physical violence, but we can, we can in the spirit realm wage war. We can. And not in a dangerous way. I'm not telling anybody to go up to Washington and stand. It's and come. spiritual warfare. I'm just, I'm just saying if we we got to take the power source away from Jezebel and Ahab, and a lot of that power source is coming from the homes. I know I can say it because I worked in it. Yeah. We both had those spirits and working in them. And, you know, a lot of times people have come to me in the past, and, and they, they'll wonder, well, why don't you do something in this situation? Well, shouldn't you do this? Well, shouldn't you do that? And I've learned some stuff. You know, when you have a Jezebel and Ahab in, in a, a marriage, somebody's got to break the initial hold. It's either got to be the man that stands up and said, okay, I'm not going to be Ahab anymore. I'm going to take authority in my home, and I'm going to break some stuff. And then that, that would give you know, enough leeway for the woman to then respond to that. And then, and then she could say, okay, I'm not going to 
allow myself to, to operate in a Jezebel spirit. We're going to get our, our family in line with what the word says, and, and then things will be in order, and, thing, and the Jezebel and Ahab can't stay here. And we do that to this day. We bind we them. Absolutely. And, and I can tell you, if you ever want to know a city where Jezebel and Ahab are, are at, Springfield, Missouri, we have to pray like you wouldn't believe. We have to go get groceries up there because there's some things you can only get there, some things you have to go up there and do, you know, car repairs and things like that. And so, I mean, it's a challenge. I just feel like it's so peaceful at our office, so peaceful home. Then we go up there, and you're oh, in man. Warfare City. Yeah. And, I mean, you just got to pray the whole time. And it, it, gains, it gains strength in places. And, uh, you know, what I, one of the things that I've noticed is I won't, pray, I won't pray for deliverance with a family if I can see that there's such a stronghold of fear there. Because if you can't get the fear first, you don't need to be going after Jezebel and Ahab. No. I've seen people or heard of people have heart attacks. If, if you're in so much fear that you're shaking and trembling, I ain't going there, guys. I ain't going with you after Jezebel and Ahab if you've got that kind of, of fear factor there because I don't know that your body can handle it, especially if it's an older person. I mean, there, you yeah. you got to use sense on this stuff. You just can't go in and say, I want to do deliverance. and I wanna, You know, there, there was a situation where I prayed with a person in my family. And it, I was totally out of line on it. I, what I did is I, in my early stages, I didn't know anything about the occult, didn't know anything about that, but I'd heard a teaching on a Jezebel spirit, and I thought, oh, my word, I've got that. That's, that's how I operate. And so I went to that person in my family, and I said, I think we've got this. We don't submit to our husbands. We don't. Um, and so, so I think she just let me say the prayer, but I, I cast the thing out. And I've told you this before, that night, we both went through the same thing. We woke up at midnight, and I was woke up terrified that a female was missing. So the only thing I know is I went and checked on my two girls, and they were safe in their beds, and I, I just went back to the bedroom, and I thought, well, how stupid was that? You know what? And so the next day I heard from that person in my family. They did the same thing. Mm -hmm. And you know why we did that? Because that thing was so prevalent with us, it was like family. It, was, it wasn't even, I, I can look back now, and most of those thoughts weren't even my thoughts. It was the accuser of the brethren working through that Jezebel spirit to attack you. That's why they call them a, a familiar spirit. They're, they're That's within it. Within the family That's line. That's it. Now, my mistake was this. God had me in a healing process. And so, I mean, I was, I've been fighting the Jezebel spirit ever since to ensure it doesn't work in our family and stuff. That other person wasn't ready for that. So, I mean, you can make big mistakes on trying to cast things out uh, unless there's, you know, you got to make sure there's a, a some kind of a system set in place to help them after that. It's not just get rid of a Jezebel. Then you've got one heck of a process trying to get rid of the mindset. Oh, absolutely. And you've got to have. You got to renew the mind. You you got to fill the space. And see, uh, back then I wasn't watching TV. I, I had taken. I I thought I'm going to get away from electronics. This is part of my problem. And I was. I got away from TV and I'd go out every night and and pray and seek God. So He was just taking me step by step on how to do this, but I'm not, I'm not going to jump in the middle of a family that's got some kind of dynamic going on and then some big tragedy happened or something. you got to use practical sense. That's why I just go step by step. If, well, if I, God tells me to do something, I will do that step. And then he'll say, if you get this response, you can do this step. And, and there's wisdom in that because I've, I know people, some people aren't able to handle this kind of warfare. I'm, I was young enough I was strong enough to handle it. I would hate to see somebody 70 years old go through what I went through. I mean, most people in their 70s, that's when you start getting sick. That's why we have Medicare. You get older and your body starts falling apart because of all the junk we went through. And you lose neuroplasticity where you can't renew the mind the way you could have when mm -hmm. you were younger, too. So, I mean, there's a process that we have to... There is, and I think with this, and, well, and, and in fact, I've even been thinking because I've... Uh, you know, I've seen where some some of the mega church pastors where they're teaching who we are in Christ, but they they never teach repentance or anything. And one of me had you can call it a slip of tongue or whatever, but he said, "Not only do I have my Almighty God inside, but I am God Almighty." And and I've really been just praying about that. And and this is this is what God told me. He said that everything that we do in the kingdom of God, anything, has to start with repentance. You know, when Jesus came, John the Baptist came, uh, repent. He went to God's people and said, repent. Jesus went to God's people and said, repent. And what does, what does the Jezebel spirit 
prompt you never to do. To Admit repent. you did anything wrong and repent. It's yes. all the other person's fault. Yes. But they did this, they did this, they did this. Yeah. Never looking at what you do. And it's always two-sided. Always. Always. always and two-sided. and there's, there's guilt on both sides. But so to, to deal with it, I mean, God has to bring us to a place of repentance to take out the anchor of Jezebel, Ahab, or whatever. Mm-hmm. And and once you, you repent, then you cast it out, and then you fill it with the same spirit that was behind Elijah, which mm-hmm. is the Holy Spirit. And I think it's even that way. You know, the the word is full of of who we are in Christ. How do we access that? Where I see that this is who I am in Christ, but I'm not mimicking it. I'm, I, I'm, that's not a part of who I am. I'm I'm not representing that. The only way to get there is I've got to repent. Cast off the old to put on the new. And most of the body of Christ, and, and God was sharing this with me as I was kind of praying and getting ready this morning. He says, we're like the little boy who went out and got dirty from one end to the other. And his mom says, go get cleaned up. And what he does is he leaves on. He, he doesn't take a bath. He doesn't even take off his old clothes. He tries to put the new clean clothes over his old clothes thinking he's clean. That's the state of most of the body of Christ right now. Mm-hmm that we were going to have to repent, have the washing of the water of the word. And Paul was emphatic. He says, you have to put off the old man before you can put on the new. And it's a process. It's not a one-time event. And daily, especially if you have moved in the, in the, in the Ahab or Jezebel spirit, it has been with you so long. Some of, for some of us, it's been there since birth. We both had the propensities, had the propensity to that. And so it has, it has helped form a pseudo-character within you. That's not the character of Christ. And so daily you have to be on, even if you cast it out, you're, you're still, if, if you're not renewing your mind and looking for those things, you'll go back into old habits. You'll go back into old things that are not kingdom-based because well, those are more familiar. Than, because when you, when you first repent and you begin doing it, it's doing it God's way that feels funny. It's, it's not the other way right. because that's familiar with it, you. It gets a hold of people in their formative years. Yes. This is why usually if you have Jezebel and Ahab in a house, the kids will follow suit because they were raised in that house. I remember well when God uh, told me that I need to repent because I didn't, have my, I didn't teach my girls to respect you, and I didn't. I didn't because I, you, would, you had always been raised, everything was no. And no matter what the question was, no matter what the request, the answer was no. And so if, if the kids would want something that I thought, well, that's something they could have, instead of me ever talking it through with you or something like that, you, you'd say no. And then I'd tell the kids, I'll get it. Yeah. Like if it's a puppy or, you know what I'm Whatever, saying? Whatever, yeah. And, and what I should, I mean, a godly thing to have done, if I'd been a godly woman back then and had anything straightened out, I would have come to you and talked it out. You well, know, because we have to talk things out. We, you know, we get into it still to this day. There's things we don't agree on. Yeah. And so, so then we have to grab it and say, okay, now let's look at this. And, and I will always say, I refuse to operate in a Jezebel spirit. And you, you will say, I refuse to operate in an Ahab or Jezebel, be either one of us, because I think it can just flip back and forth. It can. It's rotational. <laughs> the donkey can show yes. up from time to time. But, I mean, if anybody wants to, to see how we made it through that, it, we're, we're still, yeah. every day you've got to be so determined you're not going to allow that to even put a thought in your head. That's why it says to cast out, you know, yeah. cast off everything. That's every, against, every vain imagination. Yeah. And it's sneaky because it waits till you're tired or yep. you're hurting or that's whatever right. for it to show up. And that's when we need to be on guard the most. And, you know, and, and, and all of this, and, and I've, I've shared this with you before, you know, we both had problems in, in, our, in our younger marriage and everything. But still, in the midst of that, you were the best mom I'd ever seen. Which well, I probably, appreciate you probably testifies that. to how sucky the examples I had when I was when I was young. Uh, you know, we we can both look back. And I don't. I I look back and just still have to pray through times where I think, oh, if I just handled that better, if I, why didn't I see what, you know, and I look back at that, but um, anytime I've ever said that, Steph's always so good to say, mom, you were a good mom. <laughs> um, but, you know, but, I, I look back, you know, we, we had all this stuff going on, our dynamic was off, but I sat and watched you, from my point of view, in amazement, that you 
got involved with the kids' parties at school, that you made cupcakes, that you, you I, one of the reasons why I was 128 pounds at, at 18 years old when I went into the Army was because during, I was, I was a, a latchkey kid, okay? There was no planning for me to even have food in the house. I, I had to scrounge for food, and I even had neighbors feed me and, and different things. And to see you worried about if the kids had cupcakes at parties and all these things. I never saw that. I know. I never saw that. And and I could see it because you would I could see the like a a little kid's excitement in your face when I'd fix special things at home. I knew you didn't get it. And that's why I, I am so um I just have a heart for kids, and it's been there as long as I can remember. I, it's not anything in me. I just think it's something God put in me. And I can't stand to, to think of a little child not feeling like that they're precious or that, you know, we used to have a, when I had Steffi, we lived in a mobile home. That was when I was working at Fort Leonard Wood, and, and we lived across from this family that uh, had several little kids and very poverty-stricken. Um, my mom was crying one day because she said that one of those little kids said that they were having onion sandwiches for supper. Um, when the parents had went out that day to eat at McDonald's. Yeah. And, and, st- and so it's, it was, it's that kind of stuff I've seen over and over. Things that uh, happen at school that just set children up for failure. You know, getting made fun of for this. Uh, teachers making big differences and just horrible things. And so, so it always made me want to to make sure kids know how precious they are to God. Yeah. They are precious to him. Every person born is precious, precious. to God. And, and, and he puts out paths before you. And then we make choices, and the enemy pushes us to make wrong choices. But he will always lay out a path to get you to a safe place, a good place, a blessed place. And so the, the way I look at it, when, when there's a kid... Do everything you can to steer them on that path where they're going to be blessed. You know, I, I know that we have to make a stand against um, what the Bible says is a God. I make a stand against what is against what God says is a biblical life. Homosexuality. I mean, there's no way getting around it. I've looked to see, is there any way I'm wrong on this, God? And it's, it's not. It's as clear as anything in well, the Paul world. Paul went as far as to say they will not inherit the kingdom. But if you've seen what I've seen and how Satan is trying to mutilate these kids, and it is one of the most heartbreaking situations you have ever seen in your life, I just want to gather them in and say, oh, little babies, come here. And, I mean, these are grown people, but I, I look at them and I think, what has Satan done? What has he done? Yeah. And uh, so, you well, know, what, well, we're, you, what you, we're called to do right now is is the Great Commission. It's to yes. get soul saved. we got to keep that at the the front of our minds. Get soul saved and teach them how and, to walk with God. And get them delivered. Yeah. Get them delivered. You know, one of the things I was told one time is that most of the a gay community up in, in Springfield, Missouri, are preacher's kids. Yeah. And so that's what made me put together the other day. That's one of the things that we got to deal with in Springfield is Aetha Lie because she goes after the anointed. Yeah. And so they're after, and see that legacy Jezebel doesn't want a legacy. You don't need no. it on a land. You don't need it in your kids. We need to take the Jezebel spirits want to take that away from everybody. And it, it's interesting that all the ones that was around her to protect her were all eunuchs. She had emasculated them. Mm-hmm. That that's what that's what the but, that's what that spirit. But does. God always raises up an Elijah, yeah. and I am telling you, I've seen some young men raising up in an Elijah spirit. Yes, and I say, you go, Almighty God, use these people, use them to come against this, and we'll do our part. I, th- I think I think daily we need to, and Mary and I go then go through this thing. You know, Father, in the name of Jesus, I bind up Jezebel, Ahab, Ahithophel, yes. Lilith, Leviathan, Baal. No influence I've, on our family. No influence on our family. I bind up every principality, every power of a ruler of darkness, every wicked spirit in heavenly places. Watchers and their technology will not influence us or no. our bloodline and our ministry in any way, shape, or form. But we're a part of the kingdom of God, and That's we right. choose to be led by the Spirit of God. We choose to walk in God's ways and God's commandments and God's statutes. We choose to be yes, led by the do. Holy Spirit. And the one thing I, I have added after some of the things that we had that had to watch is, Father, loose the spirit of Elijah yes. on me. Yes. Loose the spirit of Elijah on me. And me on the, the spirit of a, a watchman's wife <laughs> yes. so that I can stand against it. 
And, and I just ask that God would deliver every household. Yes. Father, you see the state in every household and what's Set what the everything old in kingdom order. Kingdom of darkness has done. But Father, you are our deliverer. And sometimes I, I've seen families, guys, and I, I don't even know what to do because there's such an intertwining of everything. And so I just back off and pray. I'm not going to do anything unless God tells me to do something because you'll have a big disaster on your hands if you don't do it right. Yeah. God sees everything. We just see in part. Uh, but I, I know that there's a way out for them, and I pray, I pray for families every day. I'll thank God they may be these star families where they've put each one of them on a star, and, and there is a, a high-level entity that is coming and working through them. You can deliver them. Yes, you, you can, can break Father. the power of that entity. And I do pray and ask forgiveness for sins in those situations every day so that God can work. But, you know, that's one of the things that I, I've learned that, boy, I would tell any young person that's called to the ministry— don't don't jump in and do deliverance quickly. No. I mean, follow exactly what the Holy Spirit's telling you to do because deliverance has to be followed up. Well, but look at look at the Apostle Paul when the woman that was going behind and prophesying and she had a python spirit. Then this this is this is implied in the text if you understand the culture, but not explicit in the text. Now Paul waited three days before he did anything. I think that he began fasting and seeking mm-hmm. God. On the time to do it, as well as as getting getting himself ready to do it, right? And and so that everything God God is very strategic in everything that He does. And you can say, well, you know, I'm I'm kind of coming to the party late, if you will. God knew exactly when you were going to come in. God knew. He's got a plan. Yes, He does. Our thing is to yield to the plan, to completely yield to Christ to sanctify every area of our life, to return back to the Word of God with our whole hearts. That flows from Genesis to Revelation. It doesn't start in Matthew. It starts in Genesis 1.1. And, and to begin walking in the ways of God and begin, you see, the, there, there, are, there are stories in the Word, and, and they really happen where they had to drive out the ites after because when they were in bondage in Egypt, the ites filled the land. Okay, When you were in bondage to sin, all the ites and their attitudes and everything else filled your life. When you cross over the Jordan, you are now been giving authority. God says, you know what? You raise up the spiritual sword against these spiritual entities, and I will give you the strength and authority to drive them out. I'll be with you. We will drive them yeah, out that's together. It. And that, that, that's part of the sanctification process of the believer is routing these things out of their lives and establishing the kingdom of God in ourselves, then in our families, and then we can move to our communities. Yeah. And once we get communities, then we can go to states and, and our nation. And we have forgotten it. We think it's top down. No, it's bottom up. Yep. It's as for me in my house, I'm going to serve the Lord. And you know what? That that's why we we have the the promise in the Psalms. You know, when when you have found that secret place of the Most High, a thousand can fall by your right hand, ten thousand by your left. But you know what? It's not going to come near you. It's not going to come near that's you. Right. I, and each one of us need to find that place. Well, and I I can tell you one of the keys when I was found out of that I had a Jezebel spirit and, and we were working through all this. One of the keys was I was so enraged that that those spirits had dared to manipulate me and to use me that that became my focus. Of course I wanted our marriage to get straightened out, but I thought I'm going to find a way that this spirit cannot use me. I don't care what kind of you know, entanglement it's got me. I don't care what I've got to do with this fragmented mind they've they've made me. I am gonna get rid of this thing. And but it it was a process because my mind had been you know, Trained. when you have formative years and you're in a house with the Jezebel and Ahab, that's how you learn to think. In in other words, those spirits were your tutor. And 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 it already knows that you're thinking that way. So all it has to do is come and accuse the brethren. Yeah. You know, just, well, if he'd done this, if she'd done this, if he'd done over and over and over, and it works on your emotions, and you have to, one of the two people, if you're in a household with this, one of the two has to start the process. Yeah. And you start it with you, and you say, I'm not going to move in this. Yeah. No matter what, I'm not going to move in this. I'm not going to let myself say these things. And then that will start the breaking process of it. And sometimes when, when an Ahab stands up, Jezebel has one or two choices. They can either hit their knees and repent and cast it out, or they'll end up hitting the door. But but either way, 
you're not under control of that evil spirit anymore. Well, there's there would be nothing worse than than having this kind of a dynamic going on over and over. And then then what you do is you raise kids and they're into that. Yeah. Then that that's already going to operate. And and if you had like with my girls, um, it would have just been operating in them. They wouldn't have invited it. They wouldn't have done anything to get it. They just got it proxy by me. That was the atmosphere of the home. In other <sighs> words, it was it was you know the. Uh, things are behavioral that they they learned it by by actions well, and, and that's, attitudes. That's one of the things when you say like I was a good mom. I was I was trying every time I ever went to school or anything where they were. I mean, I had to force myself because that depression was so strong. And it you was, did it whether you felt like it or not. It was like, like it lifting two thousand pounds every step I made. Uh, but I wanted to give them them a good life. I really did. But at the same time, I I look back at that and think. How could I not see this stuff? How could I be in the middle of this? Because because it was this is one of the things whether it was a Jahab, you know, Ahab or Jezebel or another spirit when it's been in your family line forever that that's your base operating system. That's that's your world. That's the you know it's like the kid that was raised in the barn. He thinks everybody lives in a barn. That was the most natural thing to do. That's why for us as sinners, we, know we, we live in a sinful world, so sinning comes so easy. It's righteousness that's hard because you've got to crucify the flesh. And work against high-level principalities yes. you don't even know are coming at you. Absolutely. Most, and especially if you're saved, you're taught, hey, they can't mess with you. So you're just thinking, boy, I am one screwed-up person. And when the truth is that most, most of the churches and everything look more like Pinocchio with a string still attached. And it, it's, it's time for God to cut the strings yes. on on his body, on the remnant, whether it's the believer in the pew or the preacher in the pulpit. It's time to cut the strings in the That's name it. of Jesus. That's it. And we ask God to give us everything we need and send in armies of angels to help us. Yes. And we ask also that you be praying for our conference, guys. We won't be talking with you until that May 9th and 10th. Uh, we're so thankful for our partners that are praying for us. Um we know that you'll be in prayer with us during that time. And what we're asking God is just for a release of his power. Yes. That, that every person here that will, will be changed to, into a, a different state than what they are toward God. That if there's any bondage, it's going to fall off. If, if they're sick, they're going to be healed. Any deception needs to be broken. Yes, this, any this, deception. The whole conference is do not be yes. deceived. So any type of deception, deception, whether it's the UFO deception or the, de- or the deception that this is the way things are when it's Jezebel doing right, it, right. all that deception needs to be broken in the name of Jesus. We asked you to pray with us about that. We're so grateful, you guys. You, we love you, and we're going to be looking forward to talking to you again in three weeks. Um, but then Mike's going to be getting those recordings out as soon yes, as he are. can. So. And we're, we're looking forward to that, and we're double, triple checking all the equipment. We are trying to get everything in line here. <laughs> <laughs> Praying over it and awning it with oil and everything else we need to That's do right. in Jesus' name. Well, Father, we just ask that you would uh, anoint the remnant, Father, to do spiritual yes. warfare, Father. Let, let not Jezebel, Ahab, Lilith, Leviathan, Athaliah be named among us, no. but, Father, let all of us, be led by the Spirit of God. We are your sons and your daughters. It is our it is our legacy. It is our inheritance in Christ to be led by the Spirit of God and the Spirit of God alone. And Father, we call for heaven to do what it needs to do to bring us to that place. Fulfill that word, Father, that promise that we have with you. In our lives, we ask in Jesus' name. Stay informed. Tune in to weekly podcasts by Dr. Michael and Mary Lou Lake to keep you informed, inspired, and empowered in the kingdom of God. Tune in to www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of end times prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri, 
65746-0160. You can also donate online at store.biblical-life.com. That's store.biblical-life.com. 